Welcome back to another episode of Pop Culture Junkies. Today I want to talk about the Cross Gen Comics Company. Let's go. So recently Marvel had sent out solicits for a Cross Gen trade paperback that's going to be coming out. I think November, November 2nd it releases. It's going to reprint the first four issues uh, from books that were in that universe. What is CrossGen? Let's talk about it. The year is 1999. Mark Alessi has a substantial deal to sell his consulting firm to Perot Systems. For you people of a certain era, yes, it definitely comes from that Ross Perot, if you're wondering. This deal essentially gets Alessi $44 million dollars of stock options in Perot Systems. So he's, he's got this capital source with this stock, right? And he's gonna use this to fund his dream. So this potential source of capital leads Alessi to protrude his, his dream, a comics company for a whole new era. To be clear, a lot of things Alessi did at the time still exist in the industry to this day, particularly on the digital comic front. He really was paved the way there and saw the capabilities for digital comics. Not saying he did as good as Comixology or, or all the other things, Marvel Unlimited and things that exist now. But again, we're talking almost 20 plus years ago, guys, implementing the idea. He was at the forefront of that. No one was trying to do what he did to make digital comics a thing. Alessi passed in 2019 uh, with many calling CrossGen a failure. His legacy is a little more impressive though, in my opinion. He challenged the status quo in the industry. He became an inflammatory figure in the industry. And most importantly, they put out some really good comics. Like that's the most important part here. So let's dive in and make sure you know the lore of CrossGen comics. So Mark Alessi has his $44 million worth of stock in Perot Systems. He immediately founded CrossGen Comics in 1998. In 1999, he rents office space in Tampa, Florida and begins hiring staff. This is where the first key difference comes in for the way Alessi approached the business. And it really was different from what you would see from the big two in Marvel and DC, but even the smaller Dark Horse image, they operated on the same system. So it really was groundbreaking across all of those fronts. If you didn't know, most comic creators are freelancers. They work as contracted freelancers for a contracted project, and once it's done or canceled, they move on and they're no longer associated with that company, right? Unless they have other contracts. And so there is rare exclusive contracts that that tie people to a company for whatever projects they're doing. Those are really big artists typically and big writers. It's the, the big names in the industry. When Bendis went to DC, you saw something like that. But for your average comics professional working in the industry, they're not in an exclusive contract. They're hired to do a freelance job of X number of issues on X books for X time. And so what Alessi did that was different is he hired the artists, the writers, the inkers, the letters, he hired these people as full-time employees. They weren't contracted freelancers. And so what that meant was a lot of things. It meant A, they were benefited, right? You have benefits, you have a pension, you have a stable income that isn't dependent on your freelance work coming through. Your these were in a sense, almost like salaried employees. A lot of the creators say the way that he did that and they brought them all to a single headquarters really helped the creative process to have all those other people around giving you feedback. It even brought on competitions of a sort where people would be posting you know, their latest pages that they had done outside of their, their cubicle for everyone to see as they walked by and it would really challenge their teammates to meet or beat what they were doing at the time. Um, so many, many people suppose that this, this full-time employee benefited position is one of the reasons why DC and Marvel reacted to CrossGen so vehemently. Typically in the industry, when someone would go to Image or they would go to DC or they would go to Dark Horse to do a project, it was just like the business as usual. This is what happens, right? There's tales, however, of people signing with CrossGen and suddenly finding their projects canceled or even never published to begin with and just destroyed. The, again, unsubstantiated rumors, I can't prove that, but there are stories out there of that happening. 
even in interviews, Joe Casada, who was the editor in chief at Marvel at the time, was really hostile towards cross gen, and he actually encouraged fans to kind of approach them in that same hostile manner to see them as like this interloper who's intruding into the industry, shaking up the status quo. And that was abnormal, right? He didn't say that about Image. He didn't say that about Dark Horse. He didn't say that about anyone else. He never approached other comics companies like that. Why? Because if CrossGen was a success, then these large companies, it would have forced them to start treating freelancers like employees. It would have forced them to move away from this contract and model to an employed status. That's a big bill. That's going to come up later when we talk about what happened to, to CrossGen in the long run. For bigger companies like Marvel and DC, it wouldn't have been as much of an issue because they have a lot more capital. CrossGen, it did become a much larger issue, but it was another reason that those companies were not fans and they were definitely out to prove a point when they talked about CrossGen in such a negative manner. So the promise of CrossGen lured some big names. You were talking George Perez, Mark Wade. Mark Wade left as the writer for Justice League of America, JLA, when it was DC's biggest book to join CrossGen. Industry regulars like uh, Barbara Kessel, Ron Mars, these are people who maybe aren't as big as a George Perez or a Mark Wade, but could certainly have found work anywhere they wanted to work. And particularly your Perez and Wade. They could have gone to any company, Marvel or DC, and done any book that they wanted to do. They chose to go to CrossGen. Wade's on, on paper saying, I took a pay cut. Even though it was guaranteed pay, I took a pay cut to go do it because I liked the idea of what they were doing and I wanted to be a part of it. Now, that relationship soured a little later in the years, so I don't want to paint it like Mark Wade's their biggest champion now. He was certainly their biggest champion when they were forming, though, and when they first announced these creative teams. There were a lot of other newer talents that were discovered through CrossGen. Josh Middleton got a lot of his early work there when he was doing Meridian. If you look at Meridian to like his NYX covers, completely different styles. I mean, it goes to show the mastery that the man has in art, period. If you look at Meridian to NYX to his Wonder Woman covers recently, like full full complete spectrum of artistic style there. So yeah, a lot of older personalities in this bullpen, a lot of newer personalities. The fact that they were able to build a bullpen with names like these all together is pretty amazing. CrossGen initially makes a decent impact in the market when they do start releasing books. Their first two books were Scion and Meridian, I believe. Their books that they're publishing in the 2000s, they get nominated for multiple Harvey Awards at the time. I don't know if the Harvey Awards are still around, but kind of think of them as your, your Golden Globes versus your Eisner being the Oscars, if that makes sense. So they were nominated for some, some really great work that they were doing, and they start to pave the way with these early books for this big shared universe, and that they have this thing behind it called the big picture and how all these books are linked. Each book happened on a different planet, even sometimes a different galaxy, but they're all within a same universe, right? Literal universe, not like Marvel Cinematic Universe. Literal planets dotting a universe. And the books range from sci-fi to fantasy to horror. There wasn't really a traditional superhero book per se. The shared universe meant the books could cross over, but they were each free to build their own lore and story. What they did do, which was interesting, is they would typically put out an issue in a crossover from both perspectives. So if you're getting the Scion Meridian crossover, the Scion issue would be from Scion's perspective and Meridian would be from Meridian's perspective, which was kind of interesting. But at the same time, fans who were buying all the books kind of felt ripped off because it felt like you just read the same thing twice, pretty much. Through 2003, CrossGen was making a decent mark in the comics market. Meridian and Sojourn were great books. Mystic and Ruse were good books. Route 66, in my opinion, was amazing. But again, I love horror comics, so... But around 2003, things start to unravel. That's when you start to see a lot of the rumors coming out about what's going on at CrossGen, etc. I'll dive into that next time. We've already been about 10 minutes here, and I don't want to keep you guys too long. I want to thank you for tuning in. Remember to hit like and subscribe if you like this content, and I'll see you next time.